everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Let's just pause this. Let's see here. Dropbox, stop syncing. There we go. How is everybody today? Welcome to another DxO webinar. I'm your host, Photo Joseph. If you haven't joined me for one of my webinars yet, welcome. It's lovely to see you. First things first, let's get a quick little shout out in the chat room. Just want to make sure that everybody can see and hear me. A-OK, -okay. you should be seeing me, you should be hearing me, and you should be seeing my screen right now. If none of those are actually happening, all good, Jane says. Thank you very much. A bunch of people saying all good. If any of you can't see or hear me or the screen, then look around on your GoToWebinar interface. There are some buttons to turn on and off individual pieces, but you should be seeing both right now. So as I said, I am Photo Joseph. I'm a photographer, filmmaker, content creator, YouTuber, all that good stuff. And um, it is my pleasure to be hosting this podcast today or webinar today on how to make your images look all filmic like using Analog Effects Pro. So before we get into that, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, there are a whole bunch of these webinars happening. And actually curious now to see if the uh, Nick page has been updated with this yet. NickCollection.dxl.com slash webinars should show a bunch of other upcoming events <laughs> and it still doesn't but i promise soon one of these days <laughs> you will have registration links here to the other ones if you are lacking them um hit me up on social media at photo just on twitter and i can send you links individually to those um it's so bizarre they're not up yet but anyway one of these days those will that'll happen there are a bunch more coming over the next month we just signed up for a whole bunch more in september so there's uh, i think there's going to be two a week at least through september and then who knows what's beyond that so today's session, again, all about making your photos look like film, look like they came out of a film camera. Now, before we get into actually playing with the filter, what does this actually mean? And I think this is a really important thing to think about before you start digging into a picture and thinking, oh, I'm going to make it look like film. Okay, what do you mean by that? Are you talking about old, beat up, I just pulled this negative out of grandpa's closet kind of film? Are you talking about like a daguerreotype, you know, shot wet plate back in the 150 plus years ago? Is that what you're thinking? And that's fine. We can do that too. Or are you just thinking, I want it to look like it was shot on modern film, on a modern roll of Kodachrome or a modern roll of Velvia? What is it that you're trying to achieve? And a big part of what is why? What is the reason for it? Is it just because you love the colors? Great. Is it because you want to have some texture to the image to give it a little bit of grain, a little bit more, as I like to call it, a little bit more soul? Uh, okay, cool. Is it because you do want it to look like it's an old photo that was dug out of a closet? Great. When you're thinking about the approach that you're going to take, it's also really important to consider the content. Right? If you're trying to make an image look like it was dug out of a closet and was shot 50 years ago, then taking a picture of, I don't know, your iPhone, for example, and treating it to look like a really old photo isn't going to make sense. You'll look at the picture and go, okay, it looks like an old photo, but it's obviously not an old photo, so that's weird. But if you take a photo that could have been taken any time or could have been taken back in that area that you're trying to mimic the look of, then it's all going to come together much more cleanly. So part of what we're doing today, and you can see the collection of thumbnails down on the bottom here. I'm probably not going to get through all of these. I got some extras in case we end up with more time. But part of what I want to do with these is look for film type looks that match the photo, that make sense for that photo. And I think that's a really, really important aspect to it. Um, before we just jump in, a couple other things real quick. If you have any questions throughout this presentation at any time, just drop them into the chat, the same place where you all said that you could see and hear me fine. And I will be jumping back and forth to that throughout the presentation. I'm not going to save the questions to the end. I will just keep jumping in there and trying to answer them. Second thing is if you miss any part of this, you should be getting an email 24 hours after this ends with a link to the video so you can go back and watch it at any time. Eventually, don't know when, um, but eventually all of these videos will make their way onto YouTube on the DxO YouTube channel. So that, no, with that out of the way, let's start with this photo here. I am going to be working out of Lightroom Classic today. For those who've seen these webinars before, you know that I tend to jump around and use different host apps. I do this because I think it's really important to understand that you have a lot of options when you're using the NIC plugins. We're obviously using the NIC collection itself today. We're going to be using uh, Analog Effects Pro primarily, actually, I think exclusively today. But you to use that plugin, you do need a host app. I mean, kind of. You actually can use these as a standalone app just in case 
and this is just kind of one of those fun things. If you've never seen this before, if you go into your applications folder and you open up Nick Collection, you can launch any one of these as its own app. So if I launch SilverFX Pro here, it actually will open as an app. Curiously though, there is no open dialogue. So you'd think that you can't actually do anything when you're here, but you can by simply dragging and dropping a photo onto the icon that will open it. Now with that said, you have to drag and drop on a JPEG or a TIFF file. You can't drag on a raw file. The NIC collection is not a raw decoder. Historically, these plugins have been used uh, as plugins for Lightroom and Photoshop. However, if you are not a Adobe subscriber, you don't want to pay the subscription fees, then what you can use is DxO's Photo Lab, which now comes with the Nick Collection too. So you have a raw decoder, a base editor that you can use straight out of the box with the Nick Collection. You don't have to use any other host apps. But a lot of people use Lightroom, so that's what I'm gonna use today. And of course, in other presentations, I'm jumping around and using different apps. So with that said, we're gonna start with this photo here. Now this is, let me just hit the reset to make sure. Yep, this is a straight out of the camera raw file. Now, of course, as many of you understand, there's no real such thing as straight out of the camera raw because a raw file straight out of the camera is not actually visible. It is literally raw ingredients. It's like the flour and the milk and the chocolate and everything else that goes into a chocolate chip cookie. Those ingredients are not a chocolate chip cookie. You can't eat them on their own. Well, you can't, I mean, you can. Uh, you can't view a raw file on its own. It has to be baked first. It has to be cooked. And that is what the raw decoder has done. And every raw decoder will interpret that raw file differently, which is a really important aspect to understanding your raw files. Every decoder, whether you're talking about one from Adobe, from Capture One, from uh, DxO, from Apple, they will all decode it slightly differently. Once you have that file open, it is up to you to take that file the rest of the way home and to make that a finished image. And before I send any photo, any photo that started as raw, before I send any photo off to one of the Nick plugins, I always want to make sure that it is prepared optimized, if you will, for the plugin, for what I'm about to do to it. And how I optimize it will depend to a degree on what I'm planning to do to it. And if I don't know what I'm planning to do, because I'm planning, basically what I wanna do is go into the plugin, play around and see what I can come up with, then I wanna make sure I send over as much detail as possible. So looking at a photo like this, we've got some pretty strong shadows up here, which are great. I think they're beautiful and they're creative and that's the shadow that I want on there but I might want to lift those shadows up a little bit before I send it off to the plugin, just to make sure that once I'm in there, if I want to pull some detail out of that, I haven't already crushed those shadows down. So what I will typically do out of a program like Lightroom is start off with by hitting just the auto button. I just go over here and I'll click on um, auto and see what happens to it. And in this case, it lightened up the photo a bit. It made very, very little change, but that's great. That's just kind of leveled things out a little bit. And frankly, at this point, I think it's ready to go off to, um, to Lightroom. Now, another photo that I'll, a couple of the photos actually that I'll open, I'll do more work than that to it. But one of the first things I always do when I'm opening a photo like this is just hit that auto button and see what happens. Sometimes it's not good, but usually it is. Okay, so I've got this photo here. I want to edit this in Lightroom. I have a lot of choices of how to get there from, uh, I'm sorry, I want to edit this in uh, Analog FX Pro. And I have a lot of choices of how I get there. From within Lightroom, I can, and again, this is Lightroom Classic, I can just go straight into the filter. However, if I do that, then it is going to render out a TIFF file, open up in the filter, whatever I do in that filter when I hit OK is permanent. There is no changing that, there's no going back. There's, I can't go back into the filter and say, oh, I should have vignetted it a little bit less. You can't do that. So the way that you have that full control is to go into Photoshop, but not just edit in Photoshop from the top here, but to open as a smart object in Photoshop. This gives you the ultimate flexibility, and this is a workflow that you have from Lightroom classic if you are using lightroom cc then there is a workaround for this because lightroom cc does not yet have an open as smart object um that there it is um it does not have that feature in there yet there is a workaround i have covered that workaround in a blog entry on the dxo website so if you go to dxo.com and you click on the blog button scroll through there it wasn't all that long ago a few months ago i think and i wrote an article on how to do a um, a raw smart object workflow out of Lightroom CC. It's a bit cumbersome, but it works and it gives you the flexibility that you're gonna be seeing throughout the demo today. If you are not familiar with smart objects and how that works and why it's important, 
here's the key part of it. I'm looking at this photo now. It looks exactly like it did in Lightroom, but this is not a rendered out TIFF. This is actually the raw file. And you'll see over here, it's got this little icon on the uh, on the thumbnail that it indicates that this is a smart object. And when I double click that thumbnail, it opens up into the raw decoder. And one of the reasons, one of the advantages of doing this is that if you spot a mistake or you spot something else that you want to adjust at the raw level, you can do it now. So for example, I can see here because I have the clipping indicators turned on for my shadows, I can see that I am clipping my shadows a little bit there. Now it doesn't really matter. It's like black hair in the shadow under the hat. It's probably okay. But if I wanted to fix it, I could do that now and I'm still doing it at the raw level. So like I'll bring up my blacks in there a little bit and just bring a little bit more detail back into the hair. And for this photo, probably didn't matter, but that's the whole purpose of that. I just realized I haven't made my mouse bigger yet. So let me do that real quick. And then we're going to jump over to the questions and see if anybody's asking anything yet. Uh, display, give you a nice big cursor size in here. Okay, uh, quickly over to the questions. Anything coming up yet? Nothing yet. Excellent. On we go. So the other advantage of being of working with a smart object is that when I go into the plugin, I'm going to go to Analog Effects Pro, the plugin gets applied as a smart filter. What this means is that I can go back and edit the filter at any time. I can make changes to the filter even after I've hit OK and gone back into Photoshop and ultimately gone back into Lightroom. I can go back in and make changes to it at any time. And we're going to take advantage of this uh, today for sure. All right, so we're in here. We're looking at this, this uh, picture. We've got a bunch of presets and that's where I want to start. Up in the top left corner, you have a series of preset collections. Now, just in case you are not yet familiar with Analog Effects Pro, let me give you a brief tour. So again, top left, we have a button here right now. It says Classic Camera. When I click on that, it shows me different presets, different camera types, if you will. So I've got subtle bokeh camera. I've got a color cast cameras. I've got double exposure cameras. And it's nice. You see these previews generating very quickly over here on the left-hand side. So very quickly, you can get an idea of what these presets will look like. A uh, wet plate is going to be a good category. And that's actually what we're going to work with uh, for these pictures or for this picture here. So lots of different categories of looks that you might want to apply. Whenever you apply one of these, let me just grab one at random here. Pardon me. Whenever you apply one of these filter, uh, one of these presets or recipes, they're often called recipes in um, different plugins here inside of the net collection. This is applying a bunch of work over here on the right hand side. And as soon as this is done, we're going to see those pop up. Here we go. So this particular one called wet plate six has added basic adjustments, bokeh, dirt and scratches, a photo plate, a lens vignetting and a film type. And for like this one here, I can see we're getting this cool, kind of cool blur, but it's right over his eyes, probably not a very good place. If I look at the lens vignetting, is that where that's coming from? It probably is. I can move that. Nope, that's not actually where that's coming from. Uh, bokeh, it's coming from the bokeh, there it is. If I take that bokeh and I move that up, then it moves where that blur is being applied. So even if the filter isn't right to start with, you have a lot of controls to adjust it. So this is just a series of presets for that particular preset, a series of adjustments for that particular preset, but you can make your own completely. If you go back over here to the preset category, the tool combination category, you have something called build a camera. And under build a camera, you have the option to add or remove any of these adjustments in here. You can add lens distortion and zoom blurs and motion blurs and double exposures and a bunch of different stuff in here. And we're going to play with these a little bit today too. But the point is that you have great presets to start with. And they are not only a great place to learn how the app works because you apply a preset and you go, oh, that's kind of cool. How did they do that? And then you look over on the right and you go, oh, okay, this particular effect was made by that setting. Okay, cool. It's a great way to learn. It's also a great way to get inspiration. I'm a huge proponent of presets for inspiration. I will often go in and start clicking around in a bunch of presets, whether you're using the plugins like this, whether you're using Lightroom or whatever you've got, or Photoshop, or whatever you use to edit your base photos, having presets for me is a really cool place to start because I will often get inspired by presets that will take me down directions, take me down paths that I might not have otherwise thought about. So I'm a big fan of using presets for that. So with all that said, let's move on and start playing with this image. So I know in here, just playing with these, that these wet plates are going to look kind of good. And why is the wet plate going to look good? Well, this the photo of this guy, this guy's kind of timeless, right? He could be from kind of any time. I mean, maybe the style of his mustache is going to set an era, but it's a pretty base mustache he's got on. The hat is kind of a, a classic style hat. If I hit the compare button here, we'll see the original kind of classic style straw hat. The shirt... It, it's definitely a little bit on the modern side. It's probably not really from the 1850s, but it's it's not. It's like no no you know 
Apple logo sitting on there, right? I mean, this could be kind of to a degree from anywhere, so or any time. So we can get away with this filter with ha with using some of these older effects and finding something that works. Now, that's not to say that the other ones won't work, right? If I go into, um, I don't know, vintage camera and I try something here, we might absolutely find a preset that works in here as well. But because this photo looks like it could be from any time period, just about using one of these really old filter types kind of works. Or old camera types, I should say. So for this particular one, I really like that wet plate um, number one on there. And let's go back to that. There we go, wet plate number one. And I think it just it just looks really good for this. So we're going to go with that one. I'm going to hit OK, and this is going to apply it. Let me see what's going on in the Q&A. Anything? Jerry Ginsburg says, with a smart object, is the re-editing capability also available with the original Google NIC collection? Yes. Uh, that, yes, the smart filter. So the, the filter acts as a smart filter when it's applied to a smart object. And that is only out of Photoshop. That's the only place you can get that effect out of. But yes, that is uh, was possible back then. Okay, uh, all right, moving on. So so that, that one's applied to that. So now if I hit save, hit, hit, there we go, try it again, hit save. It'll save this back into Lightroom. I close this out and I go back to Lightroom and we're going to see both the original raw file there along with that PSD file or TIFF file. And the cool thing now is that if I decide to open this again, if I go into edit, now I can just say edit in Photoshop. I don't open it as a smart object because it's already a Photoshop file. So I say edit in Photoshop and I want to make sure I choose edit original. I don't want to make a copy of it. I want to edit the original. And now when I open this up, I'm going to have my original raw file, which I can still get to, right? I can still get in here and say, oh, you know, I should have lifted those, those shadows a little bit more. Let's pull those up a little bit more. Hit OK. This is going to bring me back to Photoshop. It's re-rendering the raw file. And then once it's re-rendered that, it's going to re-render the filter effect on top of it. And of course, if I want to change the filter effect, I can do that too. So you can see down here, it's in the bottom left corner. It's loading all the filter effects onto it. it takes a moment. It takes a little time to do that. Loads this up. And as soon as that's done, I'm going to jump back into the filter. So you can see that we do have complete control over editing that. Uh, let's see here. Almost done. Almost done. Remember, if you have any questions at any time, just get them in there and I'll jump to them when I'm waiting around like this. Saving them. Sometimes it takes a long time. A lot of people ask what computer I'm using. I am using a quite an old Mac, uh, iMac, 5K iMac. This is a 2015, I want to say, about this Mac. I think 2015. Uh, 2014, even older. 25-year-old iMac Pro. It still works great. Uh, okay, so we're back into the filter. I just double clicked in case you missed it. I kind of did it while I was talking about something else, but I just double clicked on the filter in the layer list and now it's opening back into the filter. It is reapplying everything. We're having to watch it reapply everything again. This this filter is one of the slowest filters of the collection because it does so much. There's so many effects that are happening. And there we go. There's the original. So at this point, I could go in and say, oh, you know, that bokeh that's applied there is just a little bit too much. Let's take that blur strength down on the bokeh. There we go. So I've lifted the shadows in the raw file, reduced the blur strength in here, hit OK. It takes me back and on we go. So again, ultimate, ultimate flexibility, which I think is really, really important. I like to work that way. Okay, so we're back into Photoshop. I'm going to hit save. I'm going to hit close. It will close when it's done saving. Yes, I know. And back into Lightroom we go. All right, let's move on to another photo. Let's do another portrait. Let's take this portrait here. Many of you might recognize this guy. This is Jeff Cable. He's a friend of mine and a, a quite a well-known photographer. He, uh, he just got back from, was it Tanzania? Some kind of African safari or something. Like some crazy, he's got wild animal photos that are just out of this world. Um, look him up. Look him up sometime. If you're looking to go to go to the bush and take pictures of awesome animals, consider going with him. Okay, so I got this lovely simple portrait. He stopped by one day to visit. We were hanging out. I shot a quick little portrait of him. Uh, not the greatest shot in the world, but you know, pretty good. And uh, I want to do a black and white of this. Okay, so I want to go black and white, and I want to go kind of film black and white. Now, I know what you're saying. If you're going to go black and white, go into Silver Effects Pro. And you're right. You're absolutely right. If I was really going to go into black and white on this, that is what I would use. But sometimes there are effects that you can do, or there are effects that you can do in Analog Effects Pro that aren't in Silver Effects Pro, things that are kind of more old film type of stuff. Silver Effects Pro is really about making real, uh, genuine film looks that are very, very like, very, very much like specific film stocks uh, with incredible, incredible amount of control. 
which incidentally, I'm doing a webinar on that on Saturday, I believe it is. Analog FX Pro is a little bit more playful and a little bit more fun. So we're gonna do a black and white version of this photo in Analog FX Pro. As I said before, I will usually start with the auto. I hit the auto button on this one, and wow, look at all that, look at all that detail that pulled up in the shadow region. Interesting, but not what I wanted. I don't want that much detail. I shot it with that much shadow because I want that much shadow in there. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna undo that because that's just way too much. Maybe I want to pull the shadows up a little bit. Maybe it's a little bit too dark. I could have exposed it a little brighter on that side. So I'll lift up my shadows a touch because we, of course, have that ability in the raw file pull up the shadows a little bit, and that's all. That's really all that I wanna do. Okay, this time I'm gonna open this directly into the filter. Instead of going through Photoshop, I'm just going to go straight into Analog FX Pro, which does mean that I will not be able to re-edit the file in the filter later, but this is another workflow. So right now you see my only option is to edit a copy with the Lightroom adjustments. Um, so, I mean, that's it, that's my option. I can edit as a TIFF or a PSD or a JPEG. I don't know why you'd go JPEG, but you can. But I would choose one of those. What color space I wanna be in, I would usually go Adobe RGB. And whether you want eight or 16 bit depth, because I'm going black and white, I'm just gonna go with eight bit, that's plenty. Um, resolution, this came up last time. Someone asked about the resolution in here. It doesn't matter. What number you type in here right now, I could type in 10,000. It doesn't matter. The file is still gonna open up with all the same number of pixels high and number of pixels wide. The only, interpretation of resolution go, it matters when it goes to print. Uh, that's all that matters. So at this point, it just doesn't matter what it is. So I'll hit edit. Oh, <laughs> I guess you have to go at least 600. Oh, is it doing? I guess it must have reset it to 600. That's the maximum. So you can't go as high as 10,000. Still doesn't matter. All right, here we go into Analog Effects Pro. And as I said, I want to do a black and white. So I'm going to start with the black and white presets because there are some. Well, once that, that one is done loading, my neighbor has a very big motorcycle. <laughs> Not a very loud one at that. Okay, we're gonna go black and white. Uh, where are we black and white? There we go, we have a whole collection of black and white cameras. So again, a great place to start is with the preset. So I like to go in here and try all these out, click on the different ones and see how they look. And some of these are gonna be lifting up the shadows too much, much like that auto effect did. Some of them will be crushing them down and making them too dark, uh, but there's options, right? And that's stuff. like that one's it's too light. I mean, it looks good, but it's too light. I do like this. Look at the, the film border that is added here. It's kind of cool. It's a little negative. I dig that. Uh, let's just try. We're going to try a couple different ones in here. And I like this. I like trying out these different presets again and looking for uh, for inspiration in here. So let's see here. We'll just let this one load up. And, you know, like this, it's like this one's kind of cool, but it's just it's way too much, way too contrasty. And kind of interesting on a photo like this, you look at it and go, okay, well, it's too contrasty, but it's very smooth. It's some really weird kind of super skin smoothing on him, which if this was a photo of a woman and I wanted to smooth out her skin, that might be okay, even though this is probably a bit too much. It's kind of glamour glowish, a little bit over the top. Um, it looks terrible on him. But let's just say that I I like what is done in here, but I just, it's too smooth on the skin. I gotta figure out where that is. Well, this is again, how, or where that's coming from. This is where the um, where the power of presets come in because you load a preset and you go oh i like this part of it but i don't like that part of it okay let's go over here to the right and dig around and see where that is coming from so let me just give you a quick little brief on how you would figure out where that glowy creamy softness is coming from the way i would do this is first of all i basically i'm going to turn each one of these on and off to see if that removes it and then once i find the one that removes it I will dig into it and figure out what slider or setting inside of that is doing it. Now, some of them you know is not going to be it. Like, it's not going to be dirt and scratches. That's clearly not going to make him glow, so I'm not going to bother with that. Basic adjustments, that's not going to be it either. Lens vignetting shouldn't be it, and sure enough, it isn't. Uh, film type, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. The film type not only is what's making it black and white, but appears to be what's making it glow as well. But let's just make sure. Let's make sure. Frames, there's no way it's going to be frames. Um, levels and curves shouldn't be levels and curves. Okay, well, it's got to be inside of the film type. All right, so I look in here and see, what are we using in here? Well, film type, we have a series of categories of film types to choose from. So unlike using Nick Silver Effects Pro, where you have literal film stock types, Kodak, Tmax 100, Fuji, blah, 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 you know, all these different actual films, here they're just these very generic categories. Warm, cool, subtle, black and white neutral, black and white toned. I want black and white, so we're gonna stick with black and white neutral. And then you just have rows of icons that don't really tell you much of anything. So you just click on a different one, you go, whoa, that is the total opposite direction. That's horrible. Definitely don't want to do that. 
and you just kind of click around and you try them out and you go, okay, yeah. So this is where that glowy thing was coming from. Um, which one was it? I think it was on this one when I started. It's that's the film type. That's the film type. It's just some weird generic thing that is happening in here that is making it glow way too much. So I know, well, that is not the one for me. So I keep going around looking for the different ones and, you know, finally find one that I like. And this one's pretty good. This is a simple, very clean black and white look on here. Uh, the shadows have not gotten too light. I'll maybe, maybe I do them a little bit darker, but it is a good baseline to work with. So, so let's do that. Let's stick with that one. In fact, I am going to make the shadows a little bit darker. I'll go up to basic adjustments and let's pull the um, brightness down a little bit in there. And if I wanted to really kind of darken the side of his face, just to bring that shadow back into there, I can always go into control points. Now control points, if you're new to these are incredibly, incredibly powerful. You are probably familiar with masking. You can mask either with a brush, you can mask with a radial gradient. So that's where you have a, a center point and a circle out of that. And the effect starts at 100% in the center of the circle and fades out to the edges. Um, I'm actually quite fond of those. I use those a lot in my work. You have linear gradients. So basically a line across the screen from here at 100% to here to 0%. You can make that as big as you want. But in the Nick collection, you have something called control points. So instead of having to brush, instead of having to try to make a radial or linear gradient fit into your complex shape, you build masks in real time based off of the values of where you drop the control point. So in this case, when I drop a control point on his cheek on there, it is going to affect the darker areas of his cheek, of his face, um, and how far out that is gonna spread is gonna depend on the size of the radius here. Now, if I wanna know exactly what's being affected, I go over here to resize this a little bit. Here we go. I go over here to this tiny little box, this is my mask box, and I click that and it shows me exactly what is going to be affected, just the shadow side of this face. If I drag that over here, it's just affecting the light side of his face. And it's a mask, so that means that the brightest areas in the mask view are being applied the most, the dark areas are being applied the least. And from here, I can change the size of this to affect just the area that I want. And if I wanted to be more precise about it too, I could option drag this over and, and add additional control points throughout the photo. So let's just go ahead and add those two control points together. I'm actually gonna group them with this little button here that allows me to control multiple control points at once. So if I adjust brightness or contrast or anything here, it's gonna affect both of them. Let's hide the mask view and then I'll go in and I'll take the brightness up on that. And you can see it's brightening up just the shadow side of his face or I could bring that back down again. And you see how it's working around his eye in there. It is not just this big wash of effect. It is very, carefully, very specifically adjusting that part of his face. So it's really, really cool, really powerful thing you can do in there. Um, I'm also gonna, just to give this a little bit more of a film look, this may be a slightly lighter film stock. I'm gonna go into film types in here and you'll notice you have sliders down here like neutral to faded. Um, and I can say, do I want this to be a, uh, a more neutral, meaning my blacks are blacker or do I want it to be more faded effect where it is going to, let's back that up a little bit, gonna make my blacks a little bit grayer so that your black point, your darkest blacks aren't quite as dark in there. It's always a good idea too, to look at your histogram and see exactly where your blacks are. And I can see down here now that I've faded this up, I've got a big gap of area where there is no data telling me that I have nothing that's pure black. I only have these grays and above. So I kind of like this. I kind of like that look in there. Maybe it's a little bit too much. Let's back it down just a little in there. There we go. And if you look closely, I don't know if you can see it on your screen across the uh, good webinar interface, but the very edges of these are actually a bit darker. So there's some kind of a vignetting or something happening in there. And it's kind of curious. This is one of those things where again, you gotta dig around in the settings to see where it's coming from. I look at that, it looks like a vignette and I go, okay, let's get rid of the vignette, turn off vignette and um, no, oh, well, that, that isn't where it's coming from. The vignette is doing something, but I actually like what the vignette is doing. It's putting a little bit more shadow on his forehead, a little bit more down here on the shirt, but this line is coming from somewhere else. So keep poking around and then you eventually figure out, oh, it's actually a frame. I was curious, huh, okay, so the frame under the category of light box is just this basic darkening from the outside in. All right, well, that to me doesn't really look like real film, so I'm gonna get rid of that. And I don't, I don't need frames at all. Let's just get rid of it entirely. And now I've got this slightly faded, um, nice black and white image in there. Does it look like film? Well, a bit speculative to some degree, but one of the ways that I can make sure that it looks like film to me 
is to add a bit more grain into this. Now this image is just a little bit too clean. It's super, super sharp, a little bit too clean. Film has texture. Film has, as I said before, I call it soul. That film grain adds a bit of depth to the picture that you don't get in a digital image. And I, for one, am a big fan of that. So I'm gonna go back into my film type, go to the grain setting and grain is partially applied. Um, when you take it up to 500, that is no grain. And I know that's a little bit confusing. Why would the biggest number be no grain? If you look at the description, it's actually grain per pixel. Idea being, being for every single pixel, how many pieces of grain are in there. And at 500, the idea is that there's so much grain, the grain is so fine that you don't see it. It's invisible. It is therefore off. But if you take that grain per pixel and you start to drag it down a little bit, as we go lower and lower, you start to see more and more grain apply. And you'll start seeing it show up in the shadows first in there, and then eventually in the mids and the highlights. And you can see that that has added a nice grain texture in there. Maybe a little bit too much. It's backed up a little bit. We don't need this to look like it was shot on uh, like T-Max 3200, but we can add that nice grain texture to it. If I take this all the way down, just if you haven't seen that before, that's what that would look like. Um, now, incidentally, if you're going to add grain to your image, do zoom into 100%. Do look at it at 100% because that's how you're going to truly see what it looks like. If you're going to print, super important that you do that so you get an idea of how that'll look. If, however, you are taking your image online, there's two different approaches to applying grain. When you put your picture, let's say, on Instagram, you are going to be scaling this down for Instagram. So the grain that looks like it does right now is not going to look like that on a smaller screen once it's zoomed out. In fact, it'll probably look a little bit more like this. So what you could do is zoom out and adjust the grain roughly and then export it out for Instagram, see how it looks. And if you decide it needs more or less, just do it again. You could also go in here and kind of resize this window a little bit and go, well, that making it smaller does look a little bit more size-wise to what will be on the phone. It's still not perfect, but, you know, it's better. And now I go, it's just, I can't even see the grain. It's all gone. All right, let's, let's, uh, let's add some more grain into there, pump some more grain into that. Or what you could do, and this is going to be the cleanest, most accurate way to do it, would be to render this out without the grain. Render, uh, export that out as a file that is the exact size that you need for your final destination. In the case of Instagram, it's 1280, no, is that right? 1280, 1080 wide, 1080 wide for Instagram. Um, and then bring that back in to the filter and add the grain while looking at it 100%. And that will give you grain that will not get scaled down when the photo gets uploaded because it will be already at the right resolution. So just different ideas on there and how you can go about uh, approaching this. So like now this looks like way too much grain. So I'm going to uh, bring that back up a little bit and get that to a happy level, happy point, hit OK, hit save, and off it goes. All right, next is going to be another photo entirely. Let's see any other questions that came in. Um, James asks, James Skogsberg says, how do we set two control points at once? I will do that again for you when I jump back in on the next photo. All right, we're going to use this filter, uh, this photo next. Okay. So now we're moving on a different, slightly different type of photo. This is travel. I mean, it's still kind of a portrait, but it's travel photo. And to me, this is very much like a Na National Geographic type of a picture. I shot this in India. I um, I love this picture. I love the green wall and the red uh, sari that she's wearing. And it's just, oh, I think it just looks fabulous. And uh, I want this to have a real rich green to this, like a really good, bright, rich green that's going to pop off of the page. Okay. And I also wanted to have a little bit of that film, what I would call the classic film grain look to it, just to give it that that little bit of, uh, well, again, that little bit of soul. Um, I say that like it's a bad thing to not have it. It's just my personal preference. I'm, you know, take it or leave it. Uh, anyway, so with this photo, once again, I will auto hit the auto button just to see what happens. Hit the auto button and uh, it actually does a lot to it, right? It really brought that green up quite a bit. I'm, it's, this is great. So I'm not going to have to really fight to find the color inside of the filter. It's all right here. So digging that. Um, it might be a little bit too much, so maybe I'll just pull the vibrance down a little bit. It's maybe even just a little bit overdone. So let's drop that down a little bit there. And then I'm going to go ahead and open this one as a smart object so that, again, I can go back in and re-edit this at any time that I want to. So there it is as a smart object. Go into the filter, Analog Effects Pro. While that's opening, so if there's any other questions. Nope, James, I'm going to come up to your question in just a second here. And I would, once again, probably start by going through the presets. And before I do, I'm going to answer James' question about the control points. So let's see here. I'm going to add control points using basic adjustments. Let's say that I wanted to add a control point to the green up here. And 
I guess it doesn't really matter, does it? I'll just add one there. I'm going to add another one. I can either option drag this to add another one, or you can just click add control point and add another one, either way. Now to group them, select multiple ones by holding down the command or the shift key to select multiple ones, right? So if I click on that, hold down shift, click that, shift, it clicks that, or I can go over here to the list and I can command or shift click through the list to select them. So either way, you can select multiples. You can actually even drag over them. However you want to do it, I've now selected multiples. Now I click on this group button right here. It's the little button that shows three control points with a line between them. You click that and it groups them. And now you only have controls on one of those points, but it will affect all three of them. So now if I select that one point, you'll see it's now showing these as well. And now if I go in there and say crank up the detail extraction, it is applying it to all three of those in there. So that's how that works. And of course, and you can see here, it now says group one as well. You can break the group too. If you click this uh, little button next to it, you click that, it breaks that group and you go back to having individual adjustments on there. Okay, let's delete that. Do I really want to delete them all? I actually do. Okay, so I wanted to uh, give this a subtle film look. I'm not trying to make this look like an old fashioned photo or anything like that, but I want to give it that little bit of texture. Uh, go through these presets, and I mean, I can already see from these presets, none of these are really going to do it. And that's the classic camera. Uh, clearly, it's something like a color cast is not what I'm going to want. Obviously, I don't want to do a wet plate photo out of this. Vintage is not my goal here. I really just want it to be a clean image. So instead of trying to use a preset, I'm going to go for the camera kit and I'm going to start from scratch. We're going to get rid of everything that's in here and just start completely from scratch. So to delete these, you roll as you roll your mouse over the list on the left, you'll see that each one has a little minus or plus that pops up, minus to remove it, plus to add it. So I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of everything in there. All right, so all that's left is basic adjustments. Now, as I click on any other one of these, it is going to replace that basic adjustments. So see, multi-lens has to replace that. Bokeh has replaced that. If you want to add an additional filter, you have to click the little plus. So again, right now, there's just Bokeh. If I click on basic adjustments, there's just basic adjustments. Bokeh went away. If I now want to add Bokeh, I have to click the plus. If I click over here, it replaces it. If I click over here on the plus, it adds it. And now I have multiple adjustments. And those are super, super important to understand uh, the difference between just replacing one and adding it in there. Okay, so I've got... Uh, I've got this this uh, basic adjustment applied, which I actually don't even need that. I'm just going to go straight to the film type. So I select film type. It replaces the basic adjustment. And now I've got, well, these film types to choose from. So what well, am I going to go for? Warm, cool, subtle, black and white, neutral, or toned? Well, definitely not black and white. I'm feeling like this image could benefit from some warmth. I think that's where I'm going to find what I want. So I'm going to start just kind of clicking through these warm categories on here, see what these look like. And you know, that's too saturated. And not really doing much of anything. It's a little bit too faded. Yeah, it's definitely too faded. It's doing some weird color shifts. Yeah, I'm just eh, not really finding anything in here. Okay, let's move on to another category. Let's go to cool and see what that looks like. Oh, actually, it's kind of made the green a little bit aqua-ish, a little bit blue. I kind of like, well, actually, I really like that one. And I go through these and see if there's something in here that I like. And again, they're just starting points. These aren't final points, but you do need to start with something. And I'm going to go for this one here. I kind of like this one. I think that's a nice simple effect on there we do a before and after you see it's very very subtle it has already added that grain let's zoom into this 100 percent we can let's go in by her face in there and we can see the difference in there we have that nice grain that really shows up beautifully in the flat areas and the green beautiful love it i can basically call this done at this point i mean that looks fantastic to me um if i want to make some changes obviously i can so let's say maybe i want to add a little bit of vignette to this so let's go over here and add a leds vignette i'm going to add it not replace it so i click the plus adds that in that's a pretty strong vignette on there so let's change the size of that make it a little bit more rectangular let's center that again maybe shrink it down a little bit there take the amount way way down i want this to be really gentle so, so vignetting starts as, in the middle at zero as you go negative it gets darker positive it gets brighter I just want it to be a little bit darker, not much. I just want it to be a really slight, subtle effect. And I think we've got it. There we go. I'm happy about that. Maybe I want to add some basic adjustments to it. Maybe it's a little bit too saturated. So I'll go and I'll add basic adjustment. It adds it to the top. I can pull a little bit of saturation out of that. Got a little bit carried away with that and dig it in. I think we're good. Do a little compare on there from the original to the new one, or we can do a side-by-side -side compare. You can do that. You can also do a split-screen compare. You can compare it however you like, whatever whatever makes you happy on there. I usually just do the full screen and toggle that down to do a before and after. I like it. Okay, I'm gonna hit okay and call that one done. Any other questions while that's coming up? Let's see here. Ray Nichols, how can you import a single image into Classic Lightroom? 
do you have to import into catalog before exporting to analog fx pro okay if you want to use a single image in lightroom you can absolutely do that you would go to close this out go to the library module and you do need to add a folder but you don't have to add the entire folder so remember that your photos in lightroom are represented by what's in the desktop or what, what's in the finder um, once pictures are in there then you can add them to a catalog and organize them however you want but you do have to pull them in from somewhere in the finder so i would go in here and add a folder and then pick the folder that i wanted so let's do i'll go to my i don't think this is in here already uh, no that's not in there already so here's a folder of pictures called snow i choose that but then i won't import all of these let's say i just want to import one let's say i just want to import the penguin so i select that one of the penguin it's adding it to the library i'm not copying or moving this it's just adding it to the library click on import and now that photo that snow folder is there but only that one photo so that's how you would add a single photo into lightroom classic okay back to this um let's see here that was that picture i'm gonna look at my notes uh ah yes next up we're going for the tunnel photo okay so here's one nope. that is uh not as exciting as i wanted it to be little background story here uh, i found on instagram go figure i was scrolling through instagram and i saw this really awesome old train tunnel surrounded by these beautiful trees and it was kind of a foggy morning so, oh man that looks so cool and i'm reading the caption and it says it's in ashland that's where i live i'm like what but this isn't in ashland and i commented to the guy i go what are you talking about i don't know where this is and he tells me where it is it's kind of like a sea like gives me a little hint you look this up it's actually the location of the last great train robbery of the West Coast United States back in the, yeah, I cannot remember the year, but a while ago. And I dig in, and it turns out this is really here. It's in my backyard. So I go to check this thing out, and I go up early one morning, and it's far too clear. Like I wanted this to be foggy and mysterious, and it just was the wrong time of year for that. I'm definitely going back this winter. But um, but I still obviously took some pictures, but as you can see, it's it, frankly, it's a bit flat and boring. So I want to do something with this. So what can I do to this picture? All right, well, let's see what we can do. Let's get into the develop menu and I'm going to start by working in Lightroom on this. I'm going to I'm going to do some extra work in Lightroom before I take this into the plugins just to give it a good starting point. So once again, we'll try the auto button. Click on auto. Nope, I liked it darker, so I'm just going to undo that. Don't like that. Um, I'll bring up the exposure a tiny bit in there. I'm going to take up my texture and clarity a bit to really add a little bit of texture and sharpness into the trees in there that's looking a little bit better in there um, i'm going to do some linear adjustments i'm going to go into a linear gradient in here and add a darkness to the bottom half of this so let's take the exposure on that down a little bit it's just a little bit bright that's a little bit better i'll add a radial gradient over to the side here over the um over that side of the hill i think that's a little what did i what happened where's my my linear gradient still there it's still there pull that down a little bit more there we go back to the radial gradients take that one you make that a little bit darker oh it's darkening the outside of it that's why i'm confused um, i need to invert that there we go invert that make that a little bit darker there it is okay that's looking better and then here's a kind of a cool thing uh the tunnel is clearly pure black or is it so it's, i'm never uh, never ceases to amaze me how much detail can be found inside of a raw file now this uh the way that i'll figure out exactly what's in there is by just grabbing the exposure slider and cranking it up and down just to see where the detail actually is and i look in there and there is a fair amount of stuff in there now it's very noisy this is quite shot at quite high iso um it is very noisy in there but there is some stuff on the walls in here that maybe i can take advantage of that was totally invisible when i had the exposure way down so what i'll do is go in and add a radial gradient in here and let's make that a little bit bigger out to the sides and i'm going to take maybe the whole exposure oops let's invert that i don't know why the radial gradients always start the wrong way in my opinion there we go invert that let's take the shadows up a bit now we're definitely getting some of that in there let's get the, actually maybe we take up the highlights a bit yeah that kind of works little highlight, little exposure, a little shadow. Now it's adding a whole bunch of noise in there, which I don't want. So I'm gonna also add some noise reduction. Let's just really crank that up in there, crank up the noise reduction, pull that back out. Um, we're getting there, I'm gonna actually pull the shadows down a little bit there, a little bit too bright. And there we go. So, you know, it's not flawless, but we do have some more texture in there to work with than was there before. All right, cool, I like that. Now I've got an image that I'm ready to take into Analog Effects Pro. So in this case, uh, 
do I want to open this as a smart object or a regular one? I would definitely open this image as a smart object. The reason for that is all the work that I just did in Lightroom will still be available in Photoshop in the raw smart object. Here's what I mean. There's the photo. Double click this, open it up. I can look at my radial gradients and there's the gradient that I just added on there. And at this point I decide, you know, I kind of overdid that. So let's just go in here and let's pull that down a little bit. We're just, we're seeing way too much noise in there. There we go, that's a little bit better. Now it's nice and black on the inside. I still have a little bit of light on the edges. I'm happier, that looks pretty cool. Okay, great. Now let's go ahead and take this into Analog Effects Pro. And while that's happening, let's see what's going on in the questions. James says, thanks. You're quite welcome, sir. All righty. So tunnel photo, what are we gonna do with this picture? Um, it's not that old daguerreotype type of picture. I don't wanna do black and white on this. Um, you know, creative decisions here. What are we gonna do? Where do we go? I'm gonna go for more of a pinhole camera type of a look. Old pinhole camera, you ever seen this before? You can actually make a pinhole camera if you've never, I've never actually done this, but you know, seen it on Pinterest. <laughs> now you can actually do this. You take a cardboard box, literally a cardboard box, um, black tape inside, outside, seal that thing from all light. Mount film, you have to load the film in a dark room, obviously, but you mount the film on the inside and you have a hole on the other side of the box, a pinhole, and you have something to cover it, like a lens cap. And you just take the lens cap off and the light flows in and it will expose the image. It's remarkable, it actually works. Now I'm gonna make a kind of a pinhole-ish looking thing on here that will look kind of relatively like a pinhole type of a camera. I don't know, we're gonna play with it. Um, there's a toy camera category, that's where I'm gonna start. There's some cool ones in here that are interesting starting points. So we'll just kind of click through and this weird, vignette. that's actually kind of cool, the kind of zoomed out, weird, greasy looking edges on there. Um, lots of different effects in here to play with to start with. So, that's kind of kooky the way that's zooming out in there. Um, and I like this one. This Toy Camera 7 is looking pretty good in there. It's really dark, it's really rich, but I'm not a fan of the zoomed out thing, at least not this strong on here. So where's that coming from? Just like we talked about before, I would go through these adjustments, turn them on and off one at a time to figure out where it's coming from. Um, now, I can already guess, this one's called Zoom and Rotate Blur. If I turn that off, voila, it's gone, perfect. Didn't want it in there anyway. Maybe want the vignette to be a bit stronger. Okay, is there a vignette applied? There certainly is. Let's take that vignette and make it even stronger in there. Let's make that really, really dark on there. It's a quite a rectangular vignette. Does that work? Or do I want it to be more round? Actually, the, the rectangular kind of works on there. But maybe we want to make this a little bit smaller. Maybe I want to drop it down a little bit so that the, uh, the center point of that, so that the, um, what do you call it, the tunnel here, is just a little bit more lit underneath it. And there we go. So now that I've done that, I feel like I've over vignetted it. Let's pull that up just a little bit. There we go. And looking pretty good. All right, so now I've got this kind of pinhole-ish look to it. Um, let's open the film type and add some more grain into it. A pinhole picture would be pretty grainy. So let's crank that grain way, way up, which means dragging the slider down. Again, backwards day. Uh, let's zoom into that and see what that looks like. And remember, it was already a pretty noisy image. So by adding this grain on top of it, one of the effects we're gonna get is we are going to be obscuring or masking a lot of that digital noise. And for my money, grain looks better than noise. I will almost always, if I have an image that has a lot of grain in it, uh, if I can't remove enough grain or remove the grain that I wanna get rid of, I will mask it with noise. And uh, other way around, if I can't remove the noise, I will mask it with grain. I will add the grain on top of it it gets rid of that digital noise pattern and it has a much more analog look to it. And that is what I would like. So for me, that looks kind of cool. I'm gonna go ahead and apply that and off we go. All right, one more image that I'm gonna play with here. And let's see here, no other questions, excellent. Let's go to, back to Lightroom in here. Let's actually save this one. Hit save on that. And I should save the other one too, just in case I decide I want it later. Close that, let's save that one too. Don't forget to save your work, people. Don't forget to save your work. And we'll close that and then back into Lightroom and I'm going to use this one. Okay, so this photo, kind of snapshot-ish. It's really not that exciting. This is New York subway, just standing there and I thought, oh, this is kind of cool. I don't know. I, the only thing that makes it kind of cool, I got the flag on the side of the train as it was going by, obviously drag the shutter. This is a longer exposure, probably a 30th of a second or so. Let's see here. Um, what is it, a 15th of a second. So definitely have that longer exposure. I got that motion blur, um, held the camera rock solid for the 
parts of the scene that weren't moving. I kind of like it. I, you know, cool. All right, good. This is the one we're going to work with. I don't know what I'm going to do to it, but I like the composition. It's not that thrilling of a shot, though. It's, I don't know. Ah, we'll see what we can do. So once again, start off with my auto toning. Actually works pretty good. I pulled down some of the highlights. Colors got nicer. I'm good with that. Okay. So let's just say I'm just going to go straight into the filter. Edit in Analog Effects Pro. And I'm going to go in here. Let's see. Right out of copy. Yes, Tiff. We'll just leave it at the default settings. That's fine. And I'm going to start playing. And again, I don't know what I want. I just don't know. So that's the fun. We're going to go in and play. We want to make it look like film to some degree, but uh, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe we're just going to go crazy with it. So I'll go in here and I'll start just clicking on random presets to see what they look like. Classic camera three. It looks kind of cool in the thumbnail. It's actually kind of neat. Well, I could dig that. All right, that's all right. Let's see what else is in here. Go into, I don't know, wet plate photography. Do I want to make it look like a wet plate photo? Probably not. Probably not really going to sell it, but, uh, you know, you could. You could. Yeah, yeah definitely now. I don't like that. Uh, let's see here. What else we got in here? Um, motion. Let's see what's under the motion category. So I click on these and, whoa. Oh, Kind of cool. We get some like weird, funky motion blur happening in there. Right? Dig that. Dig that. Let's try another one here. No, that's a bit too much. Like the whole image is blurry. Somebody couldn't hold the camera still. Um, let's try this one here. Oh, I'm kind of getting somewhere. I kind of like this. Not not a fan of the black and white, but I like this kind of swirly effect in here. So we're on to something. All right. Well, let's see what I can do with this. Let's start by choosing a different film color because I really don't want to have uh, that black and white image. So. Let's go to the cool films. I like the underground kind of cooly tones in here. We'll start clicking on some different ones. And yeah, you know, oh, actually, that was kind of good. I like those. I like this first row of them. Ooh, that one's that one's neat. It's got almost a um, bleach bypass kind of a look to it. I like the greens in the shadows. It's quite dark. It's pretty good there. Either one of those. That one's a bit too dark. Let's go for this one. Okay, so we're going to go for that one. Right, neat. Um, all right, the swirly thing. I like the swirly thing, but it's obscuring the 33. Kind of want that 33 in there. I think that's 33rd Street Station. I think that's what that means. If anybody's from New York, let me know if I got that right. Um, I'm going to go into the zoom, rotate, and blur, and that reveals this control surface, which I can now move around and reposition my blur point. So do I want to put it so that the flag is protected, or do I want to put it over here so that the 33 is protected? I'm going to go for the 33. I'm going to leave it like that. I hope we I don't actually, I don't know, maybe not. Maybe what I really want is over the flag. No, maybe I want it here. You know, what I really want is both. I want to be able to see both from, but I can't. The filter doesn't allow me to add another one of these control areas to protect a separate area. It just doesn't work that way. So what I really need to do, what I really need is to apply this to a layer in Photoshop and then apply a second copy of the same effect, but without the twirl effect kind of blend those together. That's what I need to do. But we have a problem, don't we? Remember, I didn't go into Photoshop. I just went straight into the filter. So at this point, you're going, oh, man, I totally screwed that up. I should have gone into Photoshop. Well, all is not lost. You could be thinking at this point, I've done all this work and you know, I don't want to have to recreate all that. You can save a preset, remember? So we're just going to go in here and I'm going to click on save. I'm going to call this um, 33rd Street. We we'll save that as a preset and that is going to add that entire effect that I've just done into a preset called 33rd Street. Now I'll cancel that because I don't actually want to apply this in here. And I'm back into Lightroom now. It has already generated that TIFF file. So let's get rid of that extra TIFF file. So I'm going to go to the library module to make sure that I'm looking at the right image. So right now I have the raw file selected. Uh, so there's another one in here. And there we go, that's the TIFF. So I don't, I don't want that TIFF file in there. So that's one I want to get rid of. So I'm going to right click, remove photo, actually delete that from the disk and go back to the raw photo. And now I will edit this in Photoshop as a smart object. Open up the filter and apply the preset to it. Let's see what's going on in the questions. Saad Abate says, what do, you have to what do you have to consider to either go to smart object or straight to analog pro? <laughs> it's almost like I knew you were gonna ask that because this is exactly the kind of reason you wanna do it. You're about to see one of the big advantages other than the obvious you can go back and edit it at any time. You're about to see one of the big advantages of using smart objects. Ray Nichols says, is it possible to export images from a time-lapse process in Lightroom into analog and sync a filter effect to all images? Ooh, possibly a few images in the series, in the series, probably in the series, so not to overload the system. Okay, I did, did I do batch in a video or did I just do that in the blog post? 
Okay, if you go to, I know this isn't published yet, but I've written the article. Um, if you go to dxo.com and click on the blog button, let's see, no, no new ones are up yet. So um, sometime over the next few weeks or month or sometime, an article will get posted on here that I wrote recently about doing batch processing. Now you have to use Photoshop for this, but the way batch processing works is you save the effect as an action and then you apply the action. So what you would do is in your time lapse, you would take the, let's say, 500 photos that you have in your time lapse that you want to render out as a movie, you would drop those into a folder uh, on the desktop or whatever as a series of TIFF files and then you would point Photoshop at that folder and tell it to run the batch and save those off in a new location and then take those newly processed files and import them into whatever you're using to build your time lapse. That is how you would go about doing that. So you have to do it one frame at a time, but it's absolutely possible using uh, Photoshop Actions. Okay, so back in. We are now back into or we are into Photoshop. There's my smart object, right? Remember, it's a raw file. There's my smart object. Voila. Okay, that's happy. Important because I want to be able to adjust my filter after the fact. I'm going to go into Analog Effects Pro again. We're going to select the preset that I just saved. Once this is done in here, we'll do that. And there we go. That's already there. Okay, let's go to Custom and 33rd Street. There it is. And you can see the look, the film effect, the film color, the twirl effect. It's all here. Everything is there. Okay, great. I'm happy with this. Hit OK. Now this is an editable smart object with an editable smart filter. So what I will do is duplicate this layer, which will duplicate the raw image with all the adjustments applied to it. And say so hit that, hit Command J to duplicate that. I got a second copy. Double click on the filter down here. So the top layer filter, double click on that. And I'm going to get rid of the swirly effect. So I just I want one version of this that has the swirl and one version that does not. And then I'm going to brush between them in Photoshop. All right, this is good. Let's go to zoom and rotate blur. Let's turn it off. Great. Um, one more thing. I'm looking at the flag on here. It's a little bit too contrasty. So let's just pull the contrast down a little bit on there. That's a little bit better. There we go. Get a little bit more detail back into that. Cool. Hit OK. And we're going to have two different versions of this image stacked on top of each other in Photoshop. So this is how you decide to do it this way. This is a really good reason. So there's the top one and there's the bottom one. All right, I want to draw a mask, a paint a mask in between them. You'll notice that you already have a mask sitting here. Very, very important. This mask is not a mask between the two layers. This is a mask between the filter effect and the photo. Meaning, for example, that if I go in, I'll just, I'll leave this one on, ignore the bottom. In fact, I'll hide it just so you know we're not looking at that at all. Here's the top one. There's the effect. There's the smart filter mask. If I hit the B key to get the brush, let's make this a little bit, oh, right. I have to make my cursor normal size for this part of the demo. When I grow the cursor, just to make it easier for you guys to see, it also grows the brushes, right? So that is, my brush is not really that big. My brush is actually that big. There we go. So I've got my, uh, my brush here. I've got black on there and I start painting this in and you can see, just paint it all over, that we are seeing the original photo underneath. In fact, this is probably easier to see if I did it to the bottom one because you've got the swirl on there. Grab that and I start painting this in and we are painting through to see the original photo, see without the swirl applied to it. So we're just painting between the filter effect and the original. That's not what I wanted. I'm gonna undo that. What I wanna do is I wanna paint between the entire top layer and the bottom layer. So I need to add a new mask. I've got that selected on there. I click on the mask button. Now it adds a new mask on there and now I can brush that in. So I'm gonna actually, instead of brushing it out, I'm gonna brush it in. So I will hit Command I with this mask selected, hit Command I to invert the mask and the image is now completely obscured. If I toggle it on or off, it's invisible. We're not seeing any of it. Grab my brush, let's tap X to switch over to white and see the flow is, yeah, let's have a nice low flow. And I'm gonna go in here and just start brushing in the flag on there. There we go to pull that back. And now I've got that flag restored without that swirly blur on it. If I hide the bottom layer, that's all that top layer is, right? That's it, it's just a little bit of that flag on there. If I look at the bottom layer on its own, that's all it is, put the two together and I get that. In fact, I think I went a little overboard. Let's, uh, let's brush some of this back out in there. And cool thing too, because you're in Photoshop, everything's layers and layers for days in here. So I can decide, you know, that's a little bit bright over there. Next to the flag is a little bit hot. So let's add on top of this a um, curves layer. 
I'm going to pull the highlights down and the curves a little bit with that selected. Let's just invert that just like we did before to make that whole thing invisible. Grab the brush, make it a white brush, and I will paint over that. I'm effectively burning that area by toggling the adjustment layer on and off above it. And of course, now I can go back into there and I could make that a little bit brighter, a little bit darker. So infinitely adjustable, dodging and burning. And I got it. I dig it. I like it. Hit save and away we go. And that is that. Ooh, look at that. Nailed the timing right on the hour. Man, couldn't have planned it. Um, all right. If there are any other questions, there's nothing else unanswered. If you have any other questions, drop them in there pronto. I will do my best to answer them. If you think of a question after this is over, and you wish you had asked it, you still can, it's not too late. Hit me up on social media. Twitter is the best. I'm Photo Joseph on Twitter. I'm also Photo Joseph on Facebook. And most importantly, Photo Joseph on YouTube. I would most certainly appreciate it if you stop by the YouTube channel, subscribe to that, I do all kinds of fun photo and video education. Um, and also my website, photojoseph.com, all good places to check out. Sara says, you, thank you. Well, you are quite welcome, sir. Um, if there, or ma'am, actually, I don't really, I don't realize, I don't know if that's a, Sorry, I have no idea. Uh, interesting name though, I like it. Tell me where that's from. Um, anybody else? Jane saying nice. Anybody else with any other questions, get them in there. If you, uh, anything else you wanna say, say your goodbyes, now's your chance, because I am about to bail on out of here. I hope you enjoyed today's education. Again, if you have any questions after this, just hit me up on Twitter is the best place. Um, Sada is from Detroit, well, there you go. Um, and Gerald says, great instructor. Why, thank you, Gerald, I appreciate that. Again, any questions afterwards, hit me up on social media. You will get a copy of this recording uh, 24 hours after I hit the close button here. And uh, I hope to see you on another one of these webinars soon. Take care, everybody. See you next time. Bye.